Okay, so welcome back to our continuing discussion of power supplies. And we're focusing on an ATX power supplies, but we're going to talk about concepts that apply throughout uh, different switch mode power supplies. Now, in the previous video, we talked about, we started looking at the front end of the power supply, what I call the front end, the input filtering and protection uh, stage. And we specifically talked about beyond the wall outlet, what can you expect from the power company? What do they have serving your home or business? What equipment do they have? And what protection and filtering do they apply, if any? And that kind of gives us an idea of what we might need to apply. So we looked at how the power company is set up. We did some simulations in the previous video. And in this video, we're going to do a little bit deeper dive into metal oxide varistors, which we talked about uh, in the previous video. And we're going to do some modeling of an MOV. And we're going to look at how it would respond to one of our major concerns, which is a lightning pulse coming from the power company. If it makes it past all of their protection somehow into our uh, piece of equipment, how can we protect our equipment from these uh, high voltage surges that might occur? Okay, so now that we know that we got to worry about some very short duration but extremely high voltage pulses that might come into our equipment, into our house wiring, and into our microwave and our computers and any other electronic equipment. Um, basically, it's going to look like this. I've got a, a pulse, and this is, you know, tens of microseconds in duration. And the voltage can be 10,000 volts, can be 2,000 volts. And it's very dependent on what happened to the pulse upstream in the power system. But we can make some assumptions. But basically, it's going to be coming into your equipment and this is thousands of volts, and this equipment, no way it can handle it, it will blow up. So what are we going to do? Um, you know, if we had our choice, what would we put in here to protect us against this very high voltage? Well, we would like something in here that limits or clamps the voltage. So say if this is 10,000 volts, We'd prefer if we could, you know, somehow clamp that so it doesn't get above, you know, maybe 300 volts, all right? Because maybe this can withstand 300 volts. I might have a 400 volt capacitor. So if I could limit this to say 300 volts, that would be good, right? So how are we going to limit a 10,000 volt surge um, to only say 300 volts? Um, you also have to worry about energy. I mean, this is a lot of voltage and, you know, you put 10,000 volts through a low resistance, that's a lot of watts. That's a lot of energy. Um, that's a lot of amps. It could be thousands of amps flowing. If you had a one ohm resistor here and you had 10,000 volts, that's 10,000 amps flowing through here. So now you're talking, you've got you to gotta think about this and how you're going to deal with it. So what we would like is some sort of device that you could put here that under normal conditions would be kind of transparent to the system. You wouldn't even notice it. But when a big high voltage spike comes through, it would go into action. It would shunt that voltage, that spike, and shunt the current, send it back to where it came from, and limit the voltage on this circuit so it's not going to damage anything. Well, um, there is a device like that. And in fact, the power company uses it all over the place on its power system to do the same thing. And it's called a metal oxide varistor. So what is a metal oxide varistor? Well, the best way to figure something out is to look at the name. It is a metal oxide, which describes the material it's made of. And by the way, here's an image of one that we're going to model. Metal oxide is what's inside of this. And it's a varistor. What is a varistor? Well, a varistor is a variable resistor. So how can it be a variable resistor? Well, um, this is the volts versus amps characteristic, a generalized characteristic for a varistor. And you may this may look familiar. It looks like a diode. It might look like a, a inductor, an iron core uh, inductor. Um, it has a, a nonlinear characteristic. As you can see, 
as you increase the voltage down here, you get a very little increase in current. But when you get up to a certain value, you increase the voltage, suddenly the current goes way, way up, right? So it is a variable resistor. The slope of this VI curve tells you what the resistance is. And this slope along this area, this linear area, implies it's a big resistance because you change the voltage a lot and you get a very little change in resistance, just like a, you know, a one meg resistor. However, when you get up here, the slope gets very perpendicular here. And that means um, for small changes in voltage, which means small v, you get a, a big I, which means v o, small v over big I is a very small resistor, right? So it is varying as you go along this curve, the resistance value is varying because the slope is varying, right? So it's a varistor. Now you can see, um, we said before that, you know, under normal conditions, if you're operating this area, it's just like putting a 10 meg or something resistor across your power line. Uh, it draws very little current. You don't even notice it. However, if I get a big spike of voltage up here, uh, it's going to act like a very small resistor and it's going to shunt that current through this, this metal oxide varistor and it's going to clamp the voltage. You can see how this is a voltage clamp. The voltage can't get up past a certain point because the current will just be so high, it will just act like a short circuit. So basically, at high voltages, you're applying a short circuit to your AC wall outlet, okay? That's what a metal oxide varistor does. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna model one, and here's one that, um, that I just happen to have and I'm gonna use, and it's pretty close to what we're gonna need. This is made by Borns, it's a 20D, 241K, and it has a rating. And we'll look at the rating sheet, but basically it's 200 volts DC, so normal voltage can be 200 volts. It will clamp, so up here around 395 or 400 volts is where it, it goes into a very low resistance characteristic, and that's the clamping. And also, we mentioned that this is going to be high energy. This can handle 108 joules, and we'll talk about that. But when you're talking about a lot of voltage and a lot of current, you've got to worry about how much energy you can handle. So if you look at the data sheet for the, um, the one we're going to model, uh, this is made by Borns. It's an MOV-20D. We're using a 241 metal oxide varistor. And you can look down here, and I've highlighted the one we're going to use. And it's maximum continuous voltage, uh, 150 RMS, 200 volts DC. And this tells you how many milliamps it takes. Um, and it also tells you the clamping voltage is about 395 volts using an 8 by 20 microsecond wave. And that just means it, it ramps up in 8 microseconds and achieves its peak and then drops in 20 microseconds. So you, it only lasts for like 30 microsecond pulse and it, can, it, it will clamp at about 400 volts. Uh, the amount of current, remember we said this is very high voltage, this is gonna be very low resistance, so the maximum peak current is gonna be 6,500 amps for about 30 microseconds, okay? So now we're seeing, wow, you're going to have a lot of current for a very short amount of time. And that goes to this joule rating. And that's how much energy. Now, joules is watts times seconds. So we'll do some calculations. But we'll see that 108 joules is what it can withstand um, at, for a very short duration pulse. Okay, so now what I've done is I've taken a very simple bridge rectifier with a capacitor and a 100 ohm load, and I've added a metal oxide varistor. And you can see this is the uh, element right here. Again, it's a Borns 20D241K, 200 volt rated, about 400 volts DC maximum clamping, and 108 joules. And I just place it across the incoming 120 volt AC line to neutral, now, I've also added a little inductance in here to simulate the, um, the line in your house and coming into your house from the utility. Um, I just picked some numbers. Um, usually, you can, if you want to estimate the 
impedance of a utility wire, you can figure at 60 hertz, it's about half an ohm per mile, just ballpark. Um, and I also got rid of the normal AC because we're not really concerned with that right now. I just putting this pulse and the pulse is initial value of zero. I'm going to set it for an on value, a peak of 2000 volts. We can change that. Um, and I'm going to delay it for 20 milliseconds. Uh, and then it's going to be an 8 by 20 microsecond pulse, which means it takes 8 microseconds to rise and 20 microseconds to decay. So let's simulate this and see what we get. So hit the running man and zoom in. The first thing I want to do is I want to measure the pulse. So again, I want to do a differential measurement. Hover over this, click, click and drag, and then here is my incoming pulse. You can see peak of 2000 volts, and it's uh, there and gone in a half a millisecond, 0.6 milliseconds, so a fraction of a millisecond and it's gone, all right? Now, what does that look like across the MOV? So we do the same thing. We get a differential across the MOV and you're down now to 0.4 kV or 400 volts. And remember, this thing is rated for maximum clamping of about 400 volts, so that makes sense. And you've limited the voltage across this MOV to about 400 volts. So, wow, it's doing its job. But we said there's going to be a lot of current involved. So now let's measure the current through this MOV. So we'll click on that and let's get rid of this initial pulse. And here is the voltage and this red is the current. You can see it's up 330 amps for maybe 30 microseconds. Okay. So, um, wow, that's a lot of current for a very short period of time. So let's try and figure out how many joules that is. Again, it's rated for 108 joules. So to measure the watts, I do an alt and then click on this MOV and it will give us, uh, let's get rid of the voltage and let's get rid of the current and just look at the watts. And let's zoom that out and you can see it goes up to for we said it's about this is about 30 microseconds. It goes up to 150,000 watts. So now if you look at the calculator, if I take 150,000 watts and let's call it a tenth of a millisecond, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 milliseconds, I get 150,000 times 0 0.0001 equals 15 joules. And you can see this is rated for 108, so we should be good. Now again, that's only at 2,000 volts. We can crank that up and call it um, 10,000 volts and see what happens. Okay, so now I re-simulated. You can see I've got 10,000 volts coming in. Again, that's not going to happen, but that's just to give you an idea. 10,000 volts and the power dissipated, we'll call it a tenth of a microsecond, whatever, or a tenth of a millisecond, is almost 3 million watts, okay? So 3 million watts times 0 0.0001 is 300 joules. And again, this is rated 108 joules, uh, not going to handle it. So again, in order for 10,000 volts to get into your house, it would have not flash over on any of the equipment uh, outside the house. So not really realistic, but at least it gives you an idea on what some of the numbers are. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about in the next video, and I encourage you to join us, uh, is, the, is more about the, the power factor correction. Uh, what is power factor correction? Uh, in, in previous videos, we talked about worrying about what's coming in from the power company. In the next video, we're going to talk about, you know, how we have to be concerned about what we might be sending out to the power company and how our equipment might be affecting other customers. So we're going to talk about uh, the input filtering stage of the power supply and lead into power factor correction 
which is another way of uh, ensuring we don't have adverse effects on other customers. So hope that helps. Take care and have a really good day. Thanks.